interesting fact if you're not on our mailing list, um, there's a list up here um, to sign up. And um, we've got to learn that whenever we have a transit topic, we could be in a bigger room down the hall. Because <laughs> this is not over yet. I'm sure. okay. So uh, everybody, as we go, can sort of squeeze the police to tell people there's more chairs over here. here. Um, before we get into this, there's, there's a couple of announcements. One is that um, we will be having a speaker here Thursday night. There's some flyers up here about it. His name is Scott Bernstein. And he is, I've been trying to think about how to say this, because he is the smartest person I've ever met in my life. And I found a quote from somebody about him that said, this is the brightest human being I've ever known. <laughs> so I can tell you what he's um, He's been involved in transit, neighborhoods, housing, energy, climate change for 30 years. Uh, founded half the organizations that have done all this, wrote the original highway, what they call the highway bill, Ice-T, and, and um, Ford started the surface transportation policy. This is a major guy, and he's brilliant. And uh, so he's gonna come look at Houston, he has some new information about, particularly about housing and, uh, and energy prices and transportation. That will be Thursday night at the United Way at 7. It's free. We just need to know you're coming so we'll know how many chairs. So didn't quite figure out how to do that. The best thing would be to go to our website and just start a sweet video, I guess. Or um, give your name to Wendy Nat right here if you're going out. So we'll, so we'll have to do that. We're also having a reception for him at 6 in the same building. Uh, we're asking for a $50 donation for that, so we need to know if you'd like to come to that and uh, tell her that too. Uh, okay, so the other, I guess the other thing is this amazing study here, which I guess... Who is it? Well, Scott Bernstein from the Center for Neighborhood Technology in uh, Chicago. Um, I, I think this, you know, I, I said at a, at a meeting recently that this might even be more important than the regional transportation plan, but that's ridiculous since it would be in that. Um, but this is huge. What we're about to talk about today will have a lot to do with how the region develops, how we move around in it, and the media. So, um, so this is an enormous thing. Friday morning, the Transportation Policy Council will hear this. Uh, they meet at 9.30 at the end of the hall in their open meetings. And, and you can sign up to speak before if you like. Um, and I, I think since it's an information item, it'll probably be close to 10. It's good, it's good to get there on time, 9.30. Um, and then on July 1st, is that, what day is that? Tuesday. 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 Again here and, and down there, and maybe in several rooms, all right, all these rooms will be a public session for coming in to hear about it, make comments, all of that. So that will be the public event, although there are many smaller ones like, like this one, so forth, to, take, to take comments from. So I think that's it. So um, I want to introduce Sam Lott, who I've been working with for quite a long time. He's a, an engineer with Kim Lee Horn, and he's the project manager for this thing, and he's also the chair of the transit Plan, transit committee of the Greater Houston Partnership, where I serve with him. We've been talking about this stuff for a long, long time. He uh, has, he gets it, you know, he understands uh, and is looking for the far into the future and has huge experience with all kinds of people who use lots of different kinds of international uh, um, applications of transit and so forth. So, so we've got a really excellent guy to kind of do this and present this stuff to us. So I'll just stop there, Sam. And we'll do this Thank you, David. I'm a little concerned about blocking some people's view. So if I may make a quick adjustment, I'm going to pull the thing. I'll probably disconnect everything in the cross. I'm going to look on my screen, and if something's going wrong up there, tell me, because I'll probably be looking at it. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. This has been a two-year journey in this particular study, and um, it's proven to have some interesting and maybe a little surprising results. And uh, it is getting a lot of attention. Um, 
just in the last few months, I haven't counted, but there's probably been eight or ten presentations to various city councils and city management groups and uh, public interest groups, stakeholders, and uh, it's, it's getting a lot of attention. So hopefully what will come out of all this activity is some decisions to move forward with for the future. Um, I like to kind of tell you where we're going first, and then we'll uh, go through. Uh, first, I want to introduce the study goals and a little bit of background. I'm going to talk to you about the freight rail system, because that has been the focus of our study. There's other aspects of rail that uh, are underway and are important uh, com components with it. We've been focusing on the freight rail system, and um, that is by scope. What can we do with the freight rail system? Commuter rail and connectivity I'll talk to you about. Principal corridors, which was a designation of certain things that we took through an analytical process. I'm going to talk to you about the operational hub terminal. And then what has resulted from all of this in the baseline system plan. And then finally, some the findings and recommendations. Uh, so let me move through that quickly. And I apologize, I'm coming off of a science inspection, so I'll probably wipe my nose periodically. Hopefully that's all. Principal goal of the study, evaluate accessibility and connectivity uh, and, and the requirements to implement a commuter rail uh, system along the most feasible corridors within the eight county area. This is the workflow plan that we have uh, been using and I won't go into detail, but it basically was a progression over the last two years to look uh, first of all uh, at what we had to work with, how could it be used, what are some of the missing pieces and how might they be adapted. Important to that is that uh, as we dug into it, there is, there is a clear and common vision in this city that has been growing over several years for some type of a regional rail system. And there's a variety of studies that are mentioned in the report, of which by the way, the full report, a draft version of it, is on the uh, project website, which is HGAC Commuter Rail. And most importantly, this work has drawn extensively from the TxDOT study that was done of the freight rail uh, network in the Houston area and throughout Texas. And we built from that. The question might be asked, what's, what's of strategic importance about this study? We've been expanding our freeway system, we've got the tollways coming online, Metro Solutions Phase 2 is now engaged and we'll soon have that in place. What's the big deal? Why focus on the freight rail network? Well, let me use a simple graphic to explain that to you. This is an um, illustration of 610 loop and the freeway system that, that is uh, integral to that. And we are experiencing, I live inside 610, and probably for the first time in the last 35 years, I now face regularly traffic congestion of major scale on 610 on the sections that have just been rebuilt. The reason is because we're not able to build our way out of the problem. And as all of our radial freeway systems and tollway systems come and interconnect here in the core of the city, we are reaching points where congestion is a, is a fact of life, particularly at the interchange. Of interesting note on this uh, diagram, the freight rail network, which are the white lines, also has a radial pattern just like our major roadway system. And it provides an opportunity to move large quantities of people in the same types of patterns that our freeway system does. And it provides potentially new capacity. Common questions that are asked. This is a set of questions that hopefully will be answered during the course of my presentation. But at the end, I'm going to come back to these. And I'll give you my thoughts on each uh, in summary. And then that will introduce the question and answer time. So I won't dwell on this. We'll come back to this later. What about the freight rail system? <clears throat> the TxDOT study has revealed that Houston's urban core lays right on top of one of the largest freight terminal operations in the country. We can't change that. That's the way we are wired. For a hundred years, the freight rail system has evolved, and our urban core sits right on top of that. And so we need to understand that the freight railroads cannot go away. And in fact, they own all of these right-of-ways, have for 100 years. So we have to work within that uh, constraint. Within 610, uh, in particular, 
we find that with the major yards that are there in the freight system, trains begin to slow and stop as they progress towards and maneuver in and out of the yards, which are right in the center of our urban core. Because of that, we realized early on and said as a simplifying principle that inside 610 loop, we needed to look at options for commuter rail, passenger trains that were on separate tracks from the freight system so the freight system can do its thing and the passenger system can have full fluidity. We've looked over the course of the study at a number of the extensions of, of what are called the freight railroads called subdivisions reaching out from the city. A couple that get a lot of attention and out, of, out of the 18 or so that are documented in our report is the uh, Eureka subdivision, the US 290 corridor, and then the uh, Galveston subdivision, which is uh, down along actually State Highway 3 is the direct adjacent roadway. But from that inf basic information, which is much more uh, extensively documented in the textile study and in our report, let me talk to you about commuter rail. <clears throat> First of all, there's multiple types of rail that this region needs and will be evolving. First and foremost is our urban light rail system. You're very familiar with that. We're launching now the final design for five more corridors that will interconnect the major urban districts in the, in the center of town. There's another type that often goes by the name commuter rail, not inappropriately, but we have chosen to identify it for purposes of distinction in our study as a suburban commuter line. This happens to be the one in Austin, um, which is now being built. This is, of course, a graphic, but some of the cars are already being delivered. It looks very much like the light rail system. It does not have overhead electrification. It has onboard diesel electric power. But it is very similar in scale and in construction to a light rail vehicle. It is what is called non-FRE compliant. It is not certified by the Federal Railroad Administration to be on the same track at the same time with the freight train. Because if they get together, the freight train is going to win big time. It is not classified for that. What we have been studying is FRA compliant <coughs> commuter rail trains, such as this one here in San Diego. And as you can see, this the classic uh, configuration has a locomotive, a lighter weight locomotive than would be used for freight, but still a locomotive pulling passenger cars. Uh, most commonly seen around the country are the bi-level cars that, that um, uh, provide extensive capacity often up to a thousand people on a train. What's the difference between these modes? First of all, is the distance that they travel, the frequency of stations, and the average speed that results from that combination. It's not a matter of the speed capability of the vehicle, it's a matter of the frequency of stations and how often they have to stop. The in-street urban uh, light rail system is designed as, as we're applying it today in the Metro Solutions Phase 2 uh, for fairly frequent station spacing, uh, even less than a mile in some places. But because of that, the average travel speed is lower. Uh, the suburban commuter line, though, is what we will begin to see evidence of. Metro's already doing planning studies related to this. And um, we're going to see uh, some things happen in the near term, I believe, that are going to fill a lot of holes that that people are wondering about, and we're calling it suburban commuter line. And then, of course, the long distance commuter rail that we have been studying with long, large distances between stations and very long reach, uh, easily out to 100 miles, well outside our study area. This is an example of suburban commuter line in Austin. It's a 30 mile line. It has a number of stations. It's an excellent example of this non FRA <coughs> compliant typical application for um, suburban use. In comparison to that, the Los Angeles Metrolink system is a uh, full-scale FRA compliant commuter rail system. It runs on the same track network as the freight trains are going to and from the Port of LA. What's shown on this graphic in the lighter weight lines are the connecting pieces of the Metro rail system uh, that include light rail and some uh, higher capacity mass transit subway lines, but you see the interconnectivity the point to be made that I'll come back to is that this pattern, this radial pattern, is very typical of what we think is needed here in Houston. And LA and Houston are automobile cities, so it was a good comparison. But this is a classic uh, FRA compliant system. Another simple graphic showing the, what I call the realm of the different uh, types of rail system. And we're dealing with that that will reach long, distance, long distances into uh, what my my planning expert friends have taught me is the exurban area. 
beyond the suburban ring that uh, exists today. Our objective has been to bring long-distance commuter rail all the way into the urban core, even up to each of the major urban districts, which are will be interconnected by the light rail system. And the suburban commuter lines typically have, uh, more commonly, an interface around the edge of the urban core, often directly into the urban light rail system. Another graphic, uh, interesting, I have a flaw in my graphic that has appeared. But if you can imagine over there on the left, a, a yellow line, again representing long distance commuter rail, coming all the way down to a point such as this, where it could create an intermodal interface. Thank you. That would be better. Long distance commuter rail will connect in at some point, and the missing arrow goes right here to a point where you can connect to either the urban light rail system or some type of circulator system, rubber tire, uh, or even higher technology that might be built someday. And then the pedestrian system interconnects it all. Our objective is to bring long, is to bring long distance commuter rail all the way to the uh, urban districts. An example of that, we took a study that was done for Texas Medical Center several years ago where they were looking at a pure concept, it's, it's conceptual only at this point, of some type of an aerial guideway system that could ring the existing uh, medical center core campus as well as the area off down to the south that will evolve as uh, another uh, major medical district. And off over here to the east, maybe your light's disappearing. <laughs> off here to the east is a potential commuter rail alignment where a, a major intermodal terminal uh, station could be built providing connectivity into the urban core. That's just an example. We went through a process called the principal corridor. Um, the principal corridor analysis would have helped us uh, reduce to a short list the number of corridors that we would take through an analytical process. We started with many corridors. This is the cor these are the corridors that resulted once we took out the parts and pieces that didn't really help us get people to the center of town. But as you can see, there were a number of corridors. We went through a process working with our task force that, that oversaw the project, of which data was an important part. Um, and we went through a, a very top level analytical uh, valuation and scoring of the various corridors in order to define five corridors that we would take into a higher level analytical process. And these are the five that came out of that, we call it the principal corridor conceptual system. I'll emphasize conceptual a number of times today. But this system was what we took into a higher level analysis. We went through a transit ridership process using the HGAC regional model, which was only eight counties, and potentially this system go much beyond that, but only eight counties for the 2035. We did capital cost estimates. We did operations and maintenance cost estimates based on a conceptual operating plan. These were conservative estimates in, in ridership for these reasons. Um, it's important to know that the thing that's happening now is the gas pump. It's been happening so fast it's impossible to capture that at this point in time in our regional models. So we don't even see in the mode split uh, mathematics to go into these models the impact of high gas prices that's dramatically changing the way people think. And these other things as well. We're beyond the scope of this study. Uh, my project manager, Earl Washington, is Earl okay? <coughs> Earl likes to call this a, a view from 30,000 feet. And that's part of the representation. These are the five principal corridors uh, that we study. Uh, the results of those initial studies are here. Uh, these are all conceptual, uh, but it does give at least an order of magnitude understanding. And as you can see, uh, home-based work is the focus of a commuter system where people are traveling long distances in the morning rush, generally coming in in most quarters, and in the evening rush hour going out, although some quarters like Galveston, uh, which has a much higher ridership because it has magnets all the way up and down the quarter that has a very good reverse flow. The other quarters have the opportunity for that as well, but the model didn't quite uh, pick up on that in, in its current form. We also studied another couple of cases. One, looking at the option, if 90A couldn't be done, the uh, <coughs> Witten subdivision and the terminal subdivision 
that uh, is the main line going east and west for Union Pacific. Uh, we said, what if that couldn't be done? Let's test an option. And we came down the BNSF Galveston line to connect with uh, a, an industrial lead, as Union Pacific considers it, called the POP subdivision, or Joe Adams says it's called POP, even though it's spelled P-O-P-P. -P. Um, and we did a study of that, and that alternative to the 90A had uh, a reasonable uh, ridership, 4,400, on, on an order of magnitude. That's pretty good. Um, and I think that it could get a lot better with further refinements to the model. We also did studies of a couple of options to the north. And um, the task force originally had advised us that they thought that 249 was probably the same catch basin as 290. So we didn't include it in the principal corridors. But interestingly enough, when we actually did the ridership studies, uh, you can see at the bottom there, 249 is uh, 5,000. And the US 290 at the top was really no less than what it had been without the 249 in the model. So the model helped us understand that there wasn't quite that uh, probable uh, duplication of, uh, of work. This is all conceptual. It's a first level test. But it allowed us to look at uh, operating costs. Uh, we were able to look at potential uh, revenue streams coming in for fares. And I'll get back to that in a little while. But in capital costs, in this broad brush estimate of those five corridors, it was a $2.9 billion capital investment. That investment would be spread across a number of sources. Um, some would be public money. Some would be private money. Uh, some would come from the federal government. Some would come from uh, local sources. Some might come from the state. Um, but this was a first blush look at an order of magnitude cost to implement this system for all those that might invest in it. What about an operational hub terminal? Using the Metrolink system as our, as our model, if you will, where it has a radial pattern just like ours, it all comes in and all the routes end at Union Passenger Terminal, or uh, lovingly known as Union Station, generally. And uh, this photograph shows in the foreground here the train yard. My mouth working. This is the train yard. It has uh, I think 14 tracks. The next slide has some information. This is uh, this is a major bus terminal. There's an underground connecting corridor that goes to all the platforms and over to the old uh, classic Union Station here. And as you can see, when this photo was taken probably about 10 years ago, there was already major high rises popping up all around it. Here is downtown, and underneath this train yard is a subway system as well as light rail systems now that all connect in at Union Station. Uh, it is a classic station, operational hub, as I call it. Um, it is a terminal, meaning trains stop their route at that point. They go in and out of revenue service. And it is basically what the regional Metrolink system is built off of. Important with that operational station is the nearby maintenance and storage facility. This is showing the track configuration through what's called the river corridor. It's about five miles long from what's represented here. Massive freight trains are passing through this corridor all day long and shuttling back and forth between Union Station and Metrolink uh, maintenance facility are those trains that are out of service. If you can envision many trains coming inbound in the morning, they go out of service and they're shuttled to the nearby maintenance and storage facility in the middle of the day. And then when they're ready to restage for the afternoon, they go back to the operational hub and they go outbound in the evening. Maintenance and storage facility operational hub are key parts. So we have looked at where those things might be. We looked at a number of uh, locations for potential operational hubs in the middle of town. We looked at uh, similarly uh, uh, some places that could be potentially maintenance and storage facilities. We went through a ranking of these using this general set of criteria. And uh, most important of that was the freight railroad operations, because we by scope have to maintain uh, the ability for the freight system to continue to grow. As we've met with the railroads, who have been walking along with us all the way through this study, these were the subdivisions that they said are critical to their operations, they're capacity constrained, they need everything they can get out of these uh, particular sets of the network to maintain uh, the movement of freight. So we took that information into uh, the important consideration. Uh, the highest ranking location for an operational hub terminal, that uh, according to our evaluation, 
is the area between Northwest Transit Center and Northwest Mall. This is not due north going up, but uh, north. Here is the Northwest Transit Center adjacent to I-10. This is 610 West Loop. Here is the Northwest Mall. And this area that you might, hopefully you can distinguish that light blue line surrounding it, is an area that could be developed into an operational hub terminal. We believe that it has the greatest potential of all the sites we looked at. Here's another graphic that has shifted a little bit north now, is straight up. Uh, the yellow band is the freeway system and in the area that TxDOT expects will be used for building a new freeway uh, interchange that's now starting to design. Up here on the north is the Hempstead Managed Lane envelope that's about to start design. And um, this is the Eureka subdivision, which is one of those that they did not say was capacity constrained. And we could come off of that and, and build a facility. This is just a quick concept. We would pull it as far down to the south as we could to be able to tie into the existing infrastructure and operational plans for the Northwest Transit Center but it allows us enough room to put in a major train yard. It also allows us to use a piece of right-of-way that TxDOT owns that will allow us to come back and interconnect. I can't tell you how important the advantage is of a dump, what's called a double-ended uh, terminal operation. Uh, union passenger terminal folks would give their IT if, they are, if their uh, configuration were double-ended. This is another, some of the graphics from the report about how we looked at potential, or redevelopment potential. And this area had by far the greatest potential. Uh, it's an area that's primarily um, uh, large tracks with warehouses on it. And we looked at the impacts in a very quick look uh, around it in terms of environmental justice and things like that. This is the maintenance and storage yard we recommend, Eureka Yard, that's just down the tracks. Um, it is substantially unused as a major rail yard. It is being used for gravel trains and things like that. But the Eureka Yard provides an excellent uh, combination. Where is that? Where's the Eureka Yard relative to the city? Uh, Eureka the Yard is. Let me. The Eureka Yard is in this little box right here. Okay. Just north of I-10, but off of the main line for the freight. The north-south street you see is TC Gesture. Okay. Okay. Good. Gotcha. And there's great separation all along here, by the way, mm -hmm. on those existing. Uh, now from that, we wanted to take the principal quarter concept, we vetted it with, with a, a number of sources, the transportation agencies, the class one railroads, most important, they own the right of way, uh, with key stakeholders like Metro, City of Houston, Harris County, and from that we uh, evaluated what could be the baseline system that comes out of this whole evaluation. We started with the principal quarter conceptual system. This was some of the various alternatives that we looked at uh, on ways you might connect trains through this most difficult area inside 610 where you would need to stay off of the, the high, high demand freight lines. These were the operating costs that came out of that uh, principal quarter concept, and we think that it's still a good ballpark number for us to think about whatever evolves eventually uh, for an operational system. This, uh, by the way, includes uh, the, the implications of, uh, of uh, revenue and uh, subsidy for a fare box recovery of 62%, which for a mass transit line is very healthy. This is a potential funding source and I just emphasize potential. We don't know. This hasn't been investigated or studied. And there's a whole lot of different opinions by different parties that have a stake in the game. Uh, when I showed this to other associates of mine from other parts of the country, they commented, well, normally state funding is a lot higher. But I think realistically now in Texas, where we are today at this point in time, it would be unrealistic to talk much higher than this. Um, but this is just an example of, of a range of uh, ways that this cost might be spread. And typically in major uh, commuter rail systems like the North Star uh, commuter rail line that's, that's about to go into service in Minneapolis, the latest one, um, some of these numbers were taken in reference from that. So what does the baseline system plan do? 
It's compatible with the current plans of the Class 1 railroads of Houston Metro and the Gulf Coast Trade Rail District. <coughs> it's suitable for progressive implementation of a conventional FRA compliant system with trains, equipment, facilities, and track infrastructure as I've described. It's similar in scale and the reach away from the city into the exurban areas as the principal corridor conceptual system. And these are the lines that we have put on the table in our report as a baseline system that accomplishes those things that I just mentioned. Um, it's different. It's some of the lines are the same, uh, but some of them are different. Let me talk to you about some of them. First of all, the US 290 Eureka subdivision corridor that I have described uh, in a couple of those examples is still in the mix. The State Highway 3 uh, to Galveston is still in the mix with the modification, let me just cycle back and forth as I talk about these, that rather than penetrating into this area of East Houston that is just massively overwhelmed with freight trains around the Port of Houston, uh, rather than try and find a way through there, we have proposed that along Griggs Road, Griggs Road, Britain Subdivision, there's a pretty good right of way between those two that you could probably uh, uh, accomplish with, without significant impact uh, on the area to bring a connecting line over to another thing that we discovered in our investigations, and that is the State Highway uh, 35 tollway alignment, not the Mikawa subdivision, but the tollway alignment that runs in parallel to Mikawa. Mikawa is one of those that's too much freight traffic, but adjacent to it, Textot has already done the studies, and in fact, we found already owns the right of way inside between 610 and 45 south for this facility, and in their uh, plan, they have allocated right of way for. Um, <coughs> some type of a rail system. So we're proposing that that be used to make this FRA compliant commuter rail system work from the south. <clears throat> 249 is included. An alternative route, the one that I mentioned that we studied as an alternative to 90A, coming from South Fort Bend uh, along the BNSF line and then up the POP subdivision that's adjacent to FM 521. It comes in directly adjacent to Texas Medical Center. Um, and then finally, the State Highway uh, 35 tollway corridor. I, I know you can't read this. It's not in the report. In the final version of the report, it will be there. But it's kind of just the logic diagram we went through. The light blue were the uh, principal corridor um, routes. The yellow are the uh, baseline system corridors. And uh, there was consideration given to several aspects. Uh, in reaching these decisions. Again, this is the principal quarter plan uh, in its long reach. Now, probably what a lot of you are here to talk about, uh, if you're interested. Um, this is a concept, emphasize that word, a concept on how that baseline system could be interconnected so that all trains could reach all uh, major urban districts along their route and ultimately reach the um, operational hub terminal there on the left. Let me show you some things. The, the yellow circles I'm going to highlight. This one we've seen before. This is the operational hub terminal off of the Eureka subdivision. Down here in the corner is where the terminal subdivision comes up from Bel Air and Memorial Park. It makes a turn and it goes, the terminal subdivision continues down towards town. You notice we stay off of that and we come in because just off to the right here is that location. <laughs> where uh, right off over here, that's the lead tracks going into Eureka Yard right there. On the other end of Eureka Yard, a concept that works by providing alternative ways to, other than the freight trains, continues out the other end of Eureka subdivision uh, along the uh, MKT abandoned right-of-way, but it turns south before it gets into the main part of the Heights, and it comes along here, and it. Uh, this is intended to be a flyover, a great separation of the freight main, uh, and ties into what's called a passenger main, taken on into town. The wrong way. This is a concept only. 
it would need to be studied in significant detail with alternatives looked at to see what might be the best solution. Now on the south side of town, the problem areas are as highlighted. The, um, I'm going into more detail than I thought, but David said we had a lot of time, so are we okay? All right. This is the pop subdivision coming in. Currently that industrial lead ends at Holcomb. And the uh, alignment that goes beyond that is now owned by the city and dedicated to other purposes. An option is to jump into the median uh, of 288, at least till we get up to about the 59 interchange, and then we probably have to hop out, and I'm suggesting in our report that we go with an aerial guideway up against the freeway. Similarly, TxDOT owns this State Highway 35 alignment to the point of Interstate 45, we like it. This is the Eastwood Transit Center right here. We could go on to an aerial structure along the freeway and tie into this one in order to gain access into those, those abandoned right-of-ways that were in the other diagram. And this is not showing it against the freeway, but it just looks like a freeway up in the air. And if you put that along the service road next to the existing aerial freeway, which is what is through most of that area I'm showing you, you wouldn't even notice that it was there. And, then the, and a train would come by instead of cars every once in a while. That's a concept. So let me get to our findings and recommendations. <clears throat> this is a summary of, of what's in the report. Uh, we believe the Metro Solutions light rail system is essential because it interconnects the urban districts. And the, the, we want to get in the vicinity of the urban districts, but we also need other means to move between the urban districts. In studying uh, work trips, infrastructure, operational constraints, <coughs> We have carried this concept forward to the various key stakeholders, key major stakeholders, of which there are a number of other stakeholders that are in the mix as well. Um, we believe that the dedicated commuter routes inside 610 loop are feasible, and that generally placing passenger and freight tracks on seg uh, trains on segregated tracks is possible. Near-term decisions need to be made on, on the operational hub terminal, and the maintenance and storage facility, but it needs to be done in a way that we can grow this over the next 30 to 50 years to serve the whole region. And that's the problem. You have to make decisions now when we may only be building in the next few years some pieces of this thing, and it, and it says, well, why do, we need, why do we need the big operational terminal? Well, because we need it for what's going to come in my children's lifetime. Glad to have my daughter here, buddy. Um, Urban districts need to plan for suitable systems to circulate and distribute large quantities of people. And the environmental impacts, we believe, are manageable from what we've looked at, including environmental justice. Economic development potential is large, particularly around uh, that west side there. Public-private development of infrastructure and facilities, we believe, is a great foundation for participation by the Class 1 railroads, for public support, and for political viability. The conceptual system ridership, we believe conservatively, is on the order of 40,000 riders a day. Um, however it comes out, if you build five lines, five to six lines, we think it will be at least 40,000 riders a day. And we believe an order of magnitude cost that we can deal with at this point in time as a planning number uh, is about $3 billion. Our recommendations. <clears throat> Move the studies into advanced planning. For example, the Gulf Coast Freight Rail District needs to look at how uh, a freight plan and a passenger plan work together to provide a, 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 an operable system. We need to conduct engineering studies of whatever are determined are the priority corridors, and we need to establish a timeline, and we recommend that we move forward with a regional system in ten, by 10 to 15 years. And we need to identify early implementation corridors. And uh, Judge Emmett, if you haven't heard, has already nominated US 290 and State Highway 3. We need to protect alignments and abandoned right-of-way inside 610. We need to make decisions and protect these for future use. We need to coordinate with TxDOT and Hectra, where near-term roadway improvements, such as the 35 tollway, uh, could provide commuter rail alignment. We need to establish an interagency task force to coordinate and work through the difficult decisions about alignments inside 610. And the proposed operational hub terminal uh, needs to be uh, validated uh, through the policy process and then right-of-way preservation needs to be made 
protect those facilities so they can be built over the course of time. So coming back to the questions. <coughs> is it feasible to build and operate a commuter rail system in our region? The answer is absolutely yes. How much would it cost and who would be served? We think the, 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 the baseline system, of which all the other corridors are possible over time as adjustments are made to, um, to, the, to the freight system, which is a big if, but if they're made, other corridors would become plausible. And we think a large quantity of the three million people that are about to move to Houston could be served by these systems because a lot of them are going to live in the next wave of development that happens outside our suburban ring. What would the benefits be and are they mean, meaningful to the average person? I live inside 610 Loop. If you take cars out of those most congested areas of 610 Loop, I directly benefit from that. I don't even have to live out there to benefit from the strategic removal of cars and traffic from those most congested connections and junctions around our uh, inner freeway system, and that's what this would accomplish. And how would we integrate commuter rail in the overall transportation system? There, there are several strategic connection points with the Metro Solutions Plan in what we've recommended. There are also additional um, links of the Metro system that are still kind of in the taking shape form that will serve some of those corridors. For example, West Park wasn't in the final baseline. One reason is because Metro already owns the right-of-way <coughs> along West Park Tollway, and that in all likelihood would be best served by a non-FRA compliant technology. So it doesn't mean there's not going to be service there, it means it's not going to be the class of equipment that we've been studying. Metro is evaluating that, and I'm sure the announcements are forthcoming. So, so uh, you've been told. On that point, let me stop and uh, ask for questions or opinions or discussion. David, you're going to moderate. Well, yeah, I want to first make just a second. I want to make a few comments because I've been involved in this as long as he has a little nowhere near the level of sort of dilettante. So, as the sort of grain of sand in the sand shoe, uh, a few things we've already talked about that are issues. One of them is he alluded to this a little bit, but we have multiple centers. You know, we're, we're looking at a system that is based on the 1900s when all these lines came into downtown Houston, and that was all it was, was downtown Houston. Now we have places bigger than downtown Houston that are, that are out in various, we have six cities that have more jobs than downtown San Diego. They're, they're enormous places. Downtown has 7% of the jobs, and it already has a 40% market share for commuters riding transit. Um, so, so all this aim at downtown um, is based on, as, as he said, let's look at what's, on, what's an option for, for the existing rail line. You know, right away is the huge thing. Right away is always for transportation, you know. That's the whole deal. So there is right away. But we have to, but I'm not, it isn't clear to me that all of these, or, or, or many of these, serve those six places, uh, or at least the five other than downtown, except by letting people off to then get on the light rail system. Now, that's that's okay. That will work in many places, obviously. But and that is the point of that system. Uh, among moving around the city for everybody, including the parking lot. So, um, then this notion of forty thousand or. 40, 50,000 boardings a day. And the boardings means get on and get off. So, so it's twice. Maybe that's 25,000 people if it's 30,000. So same with Metro's board. Um, the bus, parking my bus system delivers that same number of people right now to downtown. The same, essentially the same number of boardings. Well, is this competing? It's unclear whether it's to compete with that, put it out of business. I, I don't mean that. Conspiratorial way, but but to say, well, let's replace it. But there's something you know. We've really got to pay close attention to this very, very good service that people who use those buses have right now. They're non-stop service in the town. And this will not be non-stop. <laughs> so, so what happens to the bus system, and what happens to plans to expand the bus system as this encroaches? And this has all the glamour that elected officials like. And then the other is. 
if we're going to use this to connect to the metro system, is it absolutely necessary to penetrate to it? Because the real nightmare here, the same that we've worked with for a long time, is this is getting through the loop, getting through the right of way, getting through our neighborhoods, and for those of us who live in here. And I mean, the city, as William Trocker already did, go, whoa, wait a minute, you know, because this is, this is heavy. They even show you the loop downtown that occupies a lot of real estate. And, Isolate, will isolate some things. So there's a whole bunch of issues that we have to consider about this. Um, so comparing the boardings, you know, I'm not sure if we're spending three billion dollars for uh, for the same number of riders we're now doing with the bus system, which will, by the way, get much better as soon as the for the same reasons as soon as the light rail system is in place. So we need to compare that. So I think I've been saying since day one, we need a regional commuter transit study, not just a rail transit study, not just a freight rail based. So this notion of the suburban that the non-FRA complies is very appealing, but where do you put it? You know, it's very appealing for a lot of reasons because um, it, it, gets, it deals with these, our, our, I think what are our real current um, distances. This is hoping, or this assumes, as a lot of people do, that we will have massive development way out in Waller, way out, way past Katy and so forth. Well, is that really going to happen? Or two, do we really want to encourage that to happen? Uh, Robert Severo is one of the great researchers in this site's commuter rail, is having been one of the major precursors of sprawl in the United States, even ahead of cars. You know, so, and then finally, um, Sam in, in, in another life talks a lot about circulator systems at the other end of the scale where this is going long distances, takes you someplace, and now what? Let's say even the light rail system gets you into the gallery. Well, gallery is a pretty big place. Now what do you do once you're there? It's not a very walkable place. So in downtown, you know, you, you get in the middle. That's it. Out at the edges, there's no transit system. So circulator systems at each of these places are going to be something we have to pay a lot of money for minutes and ideal place. So, that's more money, you know, so, so to see this thing whole, as Sam and I have talked about that for a long time, and he does, um, is something we haven't quite done as a community yet. You know, and, and it's just, we want to get something done, you know, and, and so uh, I hope we will spend some time, somehow, somewhere, saying, okay, how does this fit into a bigger picture having to do with energy prices and carbon emissions and people, not, people moving back in and where it's in anymore? It doesn't mean the loop, you know. So, uh, so those are just things that I think are that are sort of hot that we have to kind of talk about. Having said all that, any comments or questions, let's start. Yeah. yeah. Um, just to talk a little bit about yours right now, if you look at the uh, the <coughs> airlines, um, they're having a lot of trouble meeting their uh, their um, fuel costs and stuff like that. So, so I think passenger rail is a possibility in the future. But Great, just inter city to city. Yes. yes. Certainly within Texas. Um, Hempstead Highway managed lanes are going in, and um, we have an opportunity to put the rail inside those managed lanes like Hardy Toll Road. If we do that right now, we can get great separation. And I wonder if you talked to uh, Harris County about that, and I have, but I haven't heard what's going to happen. Well, let me give you <coughs> some. <coughs> Let me give you some insight to that. Um, excuse me. As a matter of uh, chance, I guess, I also have done studies for textiles, that whole corridor, operational studies. Looking out 15, 20 years, how would it operate if you build a whole new freeway? Which they don't really have money to do right now, but if you did that, and you built the tollway system, and you improved all the arterial system, the highway and all the other connecting arterials. Does it work well? We found in, a, in our operational studies, which validated the major investment study conclusion, that no, that's not enough capacity for that corridor. What we found in our operational studies for TxDOT, and it's in the report, there's a summary of it in the report, but it's not in this presentation that you need to offload the demand of the corridor from the automobile rubber tire uh, mode every way you can. And it was going to need the benefit of a long distance 
large capacity system like uh, FRA compliant commuter rail for carrying those people from long distances away. And now some of the biggest traffic jams in that corridor are out 25 or 30 miles from town. And you also need to offload the corridor as you get inside the beltway because that's flooding the, the corridor as well. So we also need something like a suburban commuter line in that corridor. We need all of those modes in that particular corridor to make it work over the long term. And that has been two TxDOT studies in a row that have concluded that. And that's one reason TxDOT has been such an enthusiastic part of, of our study, because they see it as part of the, one of the pieces to, to make that work. And my proposal is what we see in the 290 corridor is what we can expect to see in a lot of the other radio corridors over the longer term. I, I guess my comment really is that I didn't see up there that grade separated rail is important. If you want high speed, you need grade separation. I mean, this is Houston after all. Well, and, and I don't disagree with you because much of my career in life has been spent in grade separated transit systems. The problem is the cost. And uh, you begin to, move, begin to move into cost levels that this city has in the past rejected, whether you go underground or above. Now, are there still benefits to that conversation? Absolutely. What has happened in the 290 corridor is there's a 50-foot right-of-way that's been preserved for transit, separate and apart from the freight tracks. So we have the opportunity to put in some type, maybe grade separated, maybe at grade rail or, or other guideway system. In addition to, we can still also use the long-distance freight rail tracks for our other purposes. Okay, I, I guess I didn't make myself plain. What I talked, I talked to Joe Adams about this, uh -huh. and what I suggested was hey, let's do some land swap. Let's move the freight rail and the commuter rail together inside of the, of the uh, toll road. And they're planning on building the toll road elevated, so why not build it at grade and put all the cross streets over? Now you've got grade separation for the freight and the commuter rail, and you preserve the corridor. It's a good time to be having those conversations because I think schematic, they're moving out of schematic design very quickly now, and so I talk, it I talk to, needs to be here and there. I talked to Art Story. A year ago, I'm supposed to have a meeting with Ed Emmett, uh, Dwayne Bohawk setting that up, and I spoke with, with uh, Joe Adams about six months ago about it. You're talking to all the right people. But not fast enough. I mean, they're in the design phase. Yeah. Yes, um, I have two questions. Mine kind of relate to what uh, David said. I think 44,000 riders is ridiculously low. I mean, ridiculous. Given gas prices now, no, I know you said that gas prices were not figured into that. Right. But I mean today, and I don't see them, you know, going way back down to two dollars or something like that. Regardless, so I think that that is, I think Metro's carrying that now on the seven miles. So see, it doesn't really make sense. Okay, that's okay. okay. And the second question is when you you made a comment about. The three million new people moving into the outside suburban ring. I I was under the impression that what is happening, especially gas prices again, people are moving in, and the new people, the inner city is going to become very very dense. Are you when you say that? Do you mean outside Fort Bend and? What did you mean? Guys? My suggestion is this. Let me answer those two questions. Okay. <coughs> I promise. The last one first. It's my personal opinion. It wasn't part of the study. But I believe, and I live inside 610 Loop, but I believe that the densification inside 610 Loop is going to be an important part of our future. But I don't think it's going to absorb 3 million people. And the densification inside the Beltway is going to be an important part of our future. But I don't think that's going to absorb 3 million people. I think by necessity, the city is going to get bigger just to handle the quantity of people that are forecast to move here. That's just an opinion. Um, it, this provides the option, for example, if I did want to live in Waller at a development around the station where I could walk to the station and still work downtown, I have the option. And so the people that do move out, if this system is built, they have the opportunity to tailor their lifestyle to a very livable community, but still get the long distance in a time predictable manner. One of the key points of a system like this is that 
you know by like like clockwork that it's going to take you 57 minutes to get to your destination. Whereas all the other modes that use parts and pieces of the roadway, you're not sure. It normally would take 45, it normally would take 30, but some days it may take an hour and a half. And as a business uh, endeavor to be at a meeting at 8 o'clock in the morning, that's a tough one to figure out. So those are some perspectives. The second one was the question that David and I had many discussions about. Well, we spent three to four hundred million building the main street line and it carries 40,000 people a day, many of which are riding from parking to the medical center in not so much a transit mode as a parking connector mode. But given the 40,000, the number of the, the distance that, that, that even in just the eight county area that I think the average 40,000 commuter rail rider would travel is probably 10 times as far as the average user, the Main Street line. <clears throat> it's doing a different kind of job. When you compare mature commuter rail systems around the country, this level of ridership is a very reasonable uh, starting point for a mature regional system. It may seem low when you compare it to the high density urban light rail system, but for long distance travel, it is a very reasonable number, and I believe it's low, as you said, I believe it's low. Um, but in doing a different kind of job, for one thing, to carry the number of people that would be on one train with one operator, with one salary, if you will, would probably take 40 buses. And so now you're paying 40 operators instead of one operator. You're burning, you're running 40 engines and propulsion systems versus one engine and propulsion system. Those are the economy of scale that have made commuter rail work in other parts of the country. And commonly, yes, you do have to transfer to some other type of circulation mode, whether you're in New York City or Washington, D.C. or Chicago or L.A. But it's all got to work together, and this is only one piece of the puzzle. So anyway, some thoughts. <laughs> I want to make one comment about what you said about people moving in and what that means. Because I don't think it means moving inside the loop. I think it means moving closer to a job so that I always wondered a long time ago why in the world anybody would go live out in Katy. Well, they live out in Katy, many of them, because they work at the energy corridor and it's an easy short ride. That's not a big deal. They're in for them because the energy corridor, which for us here is out. Sugarland is a center, fast becoming a bigger one. The Woodlands, you know, we're seeing the number of jobs out there multiplying, people coming off of I-45 and not moving. So, so these many centers, and I've been amazed this week to hear all three, to hear Bill White, Judge Emmett, and Judge Emmett's opponent, David Moonsberg, all talk about this concept of multiple centers and how important it is for us to recognize that that's what we are now and that's what we're going to be much more of later. So in is not into the central city necessarily. Depends where you work. So, so I, I've got sort of a silly question. Spending three billion dollars for 45,000 drivers is to me the, the math doesn't make a lot of sense. For 40,000, 45,000 drivers, if we redevelop an area the density of inside the periphery in Paris. It would take at three persons per rider, it would take three square miles, which probably isn't much bigger than your hub term. You could put 45,000 people in three square miles at the Paris density and not worry about encourage people to live in more. Well, let me reflect on something. Inside the periphery, Mm -hmm. In Paris, you probably have fifteen billion dollars worth of transit. I said, right. So that's what makes it work. And if we could do that, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> the other thing is, you need to bear in mind, as a public works project, three billion dollars is, generally speaking, what we accomplished when we built the I-10 freeway. That's sixty-seven thousand. As a commute, commute. it's right. doing a different job, so don't compare the two, but. If you think about this regional baseline system, it's roughly an order of magnitude public works project to the Katy Freeway project. Now, I'll point something else out. 
we're on 40,000 is at the very, very low end of the capacity of that system once it's built. It can be, it can service inner city trains, it can service other commuter rail lines, and it can grow each of those commuter rail lines to double that amount or triple that amount with the same infrastructure. You can't say that about most of the freeways that when we when we spend the billions of dollars. So that's something else to think about. And to say that's, that's half the price of the Grand Parkway, which yeah. is going to increase congestion, increase vehicle miles traveled, and increase carbon emissions, and this does the opposite. No, uh, one quick comment. I think uh, the three billion on a hundred years is less than thirty million a year. So it's a it's a real investment in long range planning. The other question that I have are the freight companies that own the corridors, are they on board and willing to share, or is there still political haggle and incentive have to be given? That's a good question because it relates to both of those issues of price and willingness. <clears throat> they would carry, we had members, including Joe Adams, who's been mentioned, on our oversight task force walking with us throughout the last two years. Some very critical meetings occurred in the last few months. As we took forward to them and said, okay, here are our principal corridors. What is viable to do in your mind? And we quickly found <coughs> out, they said, not that. But as we talked with them and we suggested some alternatives, they said, we can move forward with this and support this report. We don't necessarily buy everything in it, but we can support this effort and move forward towards the beginning to implement commuter rail using the baseline system as a starting point. So yes, they are they are willing to walk down this road with us. And when Judge Emmett stood up a few weeks ago and said, I want to move forward immediately on the 290 corridor and the Galveston State Highway 3, Joe Adams was right there beside him and saying, yeah, we can start there. Now, the other thing to consider is that part of this $3 billion is investments by the railroads because they gain better fluidity, higher capacity on those lines when you upgrade to central traffic control, when you double track, when you include uh, crossovers more frequently. So they're part of the investment of the three billion. That's not all out of the public pocket. But where exactly that falls is a process that hasn't begun yet to figure that out. I wanted to ask you to follow up on uh, phrase a couple of times, and I appreciate that you said that you live inside the loop, where you would look forward to the benefit of getting uh, cars off the freeways uh, by getting people onto these trains. I mean, isn't it the case that, haven't we established by now that building transportation infrastructure far out, uh, rather than uh, uh, creating more capacity for the people who are already there, it, what it really does is it drives up the demand for, for land out there. I mean, if we had a stock market for, for land out in the suburbs, I bet you the day the Chronicle reported that this thing was a done deal, you would see the price of land around every station you know, go up. And so are we really taking cars off the road, or are we really just creating more demand for uh, land out in the well, at four dollars a gallon gasoline, I think you would immediately take cars off the road if this system were available. And um, who knows what it will be 15 or 20 years from now. But the other point that David has been a, very much an architect of is the idea of livable centers. The purpose of this of this uh, uh, initiative here and this collaboration is that a system like this will foster livable centers in many locations along those corridors around stations. It's a natural thing. And it, it plays very well into the, the ideas and, and philosophy of this group, I think. Go down and go out down in the morning. But there will be a few. For corridors like the Galveston line, where there's a large magnet in NASA and in the city of Galveston at the medical center, you're going to probably see a lot of trains going both directions uh, throughout the morning rush and the evening rush. Now, when you use other trains on the weekends, the Galveston line will probably see trains Saturday and Sunday nonstop. Other corridors, there would be less, not none, but less. And so that's kind of an operational planning uh, process that occurs by nature of each corridor. Thank you. Sorry. Um, in, in a couple quick questions. One is, is the theory that the trains from the south would go all the way to that northwest hub, not just stop downtown? We tried to design a system to where the trains could go all the way to the point where they could be taken out of revenue service. Um, 
And so our proposal is that that be best located there on the west side. Uh, there are some concepts that are in the report that would allow trains to turn in the downtown area very efficiently if some of the routes, you know, there may be a train, one train out of four coming from Galveston that says it's a downtown route instead of a northwest transit route. And that train may turn and not go all the way, but it, that's, that's operation plan. Okay, and um, is it expected that the fares would be able to cover the operational costs of the system? Uh, are using six dollars, which is kind of an average of around the country, six dollar fare. Uh, one, way. The, one way. One way. And the limited study area of the, of the ridership model, as I mentioned, um, the op and the operations plan that was just a back of the envelope. Let's try this. It covered sixty percent of the fare box, which for transit operations is very good. The natural question is okay. Where does the other 30 plus million come from every year? And that's that's part of the financial planning. So you're saying the fare box would cover 60% of the operational costs, not the capital costs. In the hypothetical study we did, that's correct. 60%. Okay. But there is. Oh. I, have a, I have a quick question about uh, something you presented. The um, integration of a governmental agency or task force to uh, coordinate difficult alignments within 610. Yes, what do you, can you tell us more of what you think a difficult alignment situation would be and at what point in the process would a task force be implemented and who are those stakeholders? Any neighborhoods mm -hmm. perhaps? A lot of those questions regarding how you do it, you probably need to ask members of the Transportation Policy Council if they decide to move forward with this. I don't know. Uh, clearly, if the major stakeholders include the city of Houston, Tech Stop, Metro, um, uh, Harris County, uh, in the center of town, at least those, if not more. Um, there are certain alignments that we're proposing as a concept that are currently without tracks in them. That immediately means they're controversial. There are other areas where to install uh, tracks through town will require aerial guideway structures, they'll require uh, taking in a little more slice of land from the adjacent property owner, all of those things. And and we all know that if it's in my backyard, I'm concerned about it. So that makes the controversy my nature. And that, that's kind of what we're talking about. That, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any reason to be more specific about avenue whatever, because it's all purely conception. But, but any kind of transportation infrastructure, brutal and, and covers, but we can't move without it, right? Mm -hmm. Sam, what do you envision would be the operating entity to operate these commuter trains? I don't have an opinion on that. <laughs> <laughs> but there's, there's, there are options. But uh, and the railroads express any <clears throat> interest? <clears throat> Let me say, I, I won't speak for the railroads, but I have noted that both Union Pacific and BNSF are involved in passenger rail type of coordinated service in other places in the country. Union Pacific very heavily in Los Angeles, for example, and BNSF is actually, BNSF engineers are going to be driving the trains on the new North Star Line in Minneapolis. And of course, Amtrak is always a player if certain parameters are met. So. I think, isn't it true that tech stop now can operate? Well, I think some philosophically think that's true. The other is the Gulf Coast Freight Rail District. Uh, if they, if the ordinance is tweaked a little bit, they can get and do something with regard to passenger rail. So I don't know. In Harris County. In Harris County. Well, in the surrounding counties that they're part of the Gulf Coast Freight Rail District. The, the huge benefit of uh, this Highway 3 alignment and then the 290 alignment is that we're a flat area and we learned from Rita that we get stuck in traffic. This is a huge thing for getting people out of Galveston and out of Houston and out of the city away from uh, storm surge. Absolutely. So I think you need to put that on your... <laughs> Good point. Did, did you have a question? you raise your hand? Oh yes, uh, a couple of related questions uh, regarding maintenance. Um, first of all, who would be responsible for the commuters rail share of maintenance on a shared track and uh, given that you would have heavy usage because of shared service 
how do you uh, get in uh, and get these trains offline so that you, without disrupting service, to maintain the tracks? Well, um, first of all, the, the Class One railroads and the governor of Texas several years ago signed a memorandum of understanding that as improvements were made to the public benefit, whatever share of that benefit was, the public would bear the cost, and whatever share of the benefit was to the private railroad company, they would bear the cost. So that's, there's, a, there's a foundation of principle there that now needs to be evaluated specifically for given corridors and given situations, and that, that work hasn't been done. Regarding maintenance, if we ultimately evolve a double track system through all of those corridors, then certainly in the off hours where commuter trains are not active and where freight trains can be managed, uh, and the few that do travel could single track, and you can maintain the, the other track, and that's pretty common in, in high density uh, rail networks. It's not easy, but it's done. In the baseline estimate of the 2.9 billion, did that actually include a, a double track? Yeah. Uh, Dave knows I've been rapping for a long time before the price of oil went up that people should pay attention to the API projections for which are on track pretty well as any of the projections I've ever seen. And my comment is that it's amazing how fast the American people adjust to these things. Not just uh, the price of gasoline, as I call it, the tail that wags your dog, and you, they're adjusting. For example, two things is they're talking about using much, much more freight rail versus truck rail. Mm -hmm. That's already taking place, and I can imagine freight rail becoming big, 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 big business that, that is not in this study because it, it was the, the price of oil hasn't been back. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is they're outsourcing a lot fewer jobs, particularly in the manufacturing area. They had a story about furniture manufacturer no longer has it because of the shipping of the products back and forth, the cost of the fuel. So there's there's a massive adjustment taking place. These people in this country don't sit still while we do a study. They move quickly, is my comment. And I would have a question. What about Katie? I didn't understand. Nothing went out towards San Antonio. Well, the freight <laughs> rail line that used to be in the Katy corridor, at least out as far as Katy, is gone. So therefore, it wasn't in our scope. Okay. Does that mean something should happen in the Katy corridor? Absolutely, it should. It just wasn't in our scope. Okay. Uh, yeah, you should also add that you can notice nothing goes to Sugar Land either, nothing goes to the Woodlands either. That doesn't mean something shouldn't happen. It just means there's nothing easy in this system he's looking at to get to either of those places. And I'll comment though, we got as close as we could with the 249 line that maybe a five to 10 mile drive uh, from, from Woodlands would get you to a station and in a five to 10 mile drive from Sugarland would get you to a station. So we got as close as we could in the, in the quarters we could work with. Um, I have lived in Japan and now for many, many years. So I get used to all the the trains and everything, yes. yes. When I came here, I felt great and convenient to me. <laughs> Especially today, everything costs so high. Uh -huh. So I believe in this country, in Houston, we do need this good transportation system in order to improve our economy, our lifestyle. And we have to remember, we need to have a safe system. Very important. And got a good life together to get our mind, our citizens, to understand the consequences. So I fully support this. There's a growing number of people that are coming to Houston that have lived in places where there is a good multimodal transportation system, and they understand, like you do, that this is a benefit. For those of us that have grown up in Texas and always lived here and had a freeway, it's harder for us to understand, but little by little people are understanding. So we need to allow our citizens to understand the importance of One more. One more. Yes. The uh, South Main Corridor going to the Beltway, uh, you have substituted that with the other corridor going south and need that and so on. Were there any specific reasons? Was it just watership or was it that it that ends in Sugarland and there was a boat not to that way? Um, 
I'm, I'm trying to visualize your reference to South Maine. From the medical center to the beltway the, south. What, the, what's called the 90A corridor? 90A, yes, the original 90A, which was one. That is the main line that Union Pacific runs trains from the west coast going east. And it is too capacity constrained, especially considering all the growth that's going to happen in freight traffic. And uh, Union Pacific said, that's not a good idea. So we had to find an alternative. And that other route on the south end was what we came up with. And, and the Belfort Amendment now that is looked at, is that going down the line to be a library connection down to South Main? Or? Metro, I think, is looking at some options that are not on the freight rail track. I think so. Okay, we need to just stop there. Um, I, I think we've sort of touched on this notion that we, the world is changing and changing radically and changing fast. And what we're not talking about, there's a lot of people really interested in transportation, but we're not talking about the industry. The HJC is talking about it a lot. Sam certainly understands all that. But we've got to be thinking about what's this look like? Well, we have, let's just say, the city of Houston's mobility plan will not look at fuel prices, will not look at the HJC livable centers concepts, or, you know, will not have DMT lowering as a goal, will not have that. So we're talking about a world that is over, mm -hmm. and we're planning for it. <laughs> and we really, and this is about, this has nothing to do with what Sam's doing here. It's just that we, when you say that we can produce all these livable centers at these train stations, I think that would be true if we were thinking about doing that. Instead, we will be thinking about massive parking lots at these stations, and not livable, and people driving five to ten miles. So you just supposed to get there. They tried to extrapolate their straight line, maybe. They got some points. But no, he's, they, they he's very clear miles. about the system we have, how could we use it? That's what this is all about. Right. Exactly. We use the system we have. And that's only a part of the answer. Yes. There is no comprehensive answer in a single book. Okay, thank you all for just a second. Uh, if you would please, everybody, give us a hand. Thank you about these. Probably the public, public involvement about this here on Tuesday night, and Scott Bernstein coming on.